On November 14, 2021, Arena Sabalenka hit a combined 35 double faults in two matches at the WTA Finals. Two months later, she racked up a total of 56 double faults at the Australian Open and lost in the fourth round. That number skyrocketed to 152 double faults in 11 matches and a total of 440 in 2022. But just two years later, Sabalenka has become a three-time Grand Slam champion and established herself as one of the best players in the world. But how did she do it? How did she get to this point? This video is going to be different, guys. Instead of scouring the internet for the common questions about Sabalenka, I came to you for your questions because you're the most knowledgeable and passionate tennis fans out there. And let me tell you, you delivered. But before we get to those questions, we need to start with her serve. When Sabalenka was having the yips on her serve, everyone was giving their two cents on what was wrong. Some said she just hit a mental roadblock and was low on confidence. Others said it was due to technical flaws in her service game. For me, it was a case of one thing leading to another. Knowing she just couldn't get her serves ultimately just meant that she ran low on confidence and started to hit serves like this. It literally became so bad that she admitted she needed help. I cannot. This is my problem. This is my technical problem. I cannot serve like better. After picking a couple of brains, Sabalenka reached out to biomechanics expert Gavin McMillan, who identified the intrinsic problems with her serve. But first, take a listen to what he had to say about her serving problems. When I watched Serena before we got together, uh, and they kept saying to her it was mental and it's this, and then yet you're watching her match and she's fighting her ass off, and it's mental. Anybody else that's double faults, like I saw, watched her match with Goff, she double faulted 23 times, and yet fought for the last point, right? So clearly this isn't mental. She literally doesn't know how to do it. So apparently there was one major problem. That problem was with her left arm and the toss. Sabalenka's toss was way too high and it altered her service motion and caused some hiccups in a way because apart from pulling in on her back foot a little too late as she got into the trophy position, it also caused wild swings in her contact point. You could sense that it was partly due to the fact that the ball was sometimes completely out of her field of vision as she hit it, which ultimately meant that there was no sense of control over the shot. But more importantly, her tossing arm was facing in the wrong direction and dropped down straight and flat after she released the ball, which completely messed up the biomechanics because it pulled her down instead of helping her up to the ball. Also, she was pointing her racket at the back fence as she entered her motion, which prevented it from properly rotating up to her contact point. Now Gavin's philosophy revolved around getting the arms, shoulders, and spine in the right positions for maximum stroke efficiency. So when we take her video and you break down her left arm once she tosses it, not only is it on the wrong side of her head, she literally dropped it straight down and it would lock out straight, pointing at her opponent. So her right arm's falling down the minute she starts to swing at it. So nothing is in an upward motion. To understand these tiny bits, you have to watch some of the best servers in slow-mo as they drop their left arm. Look how bent Federer's is as it drops down here. Same thing with Roddick. Take a look here. Sabalenka in 2022 was doing this. But take a look at one of her practice sessions at the 2024 US Open and you'll notice how the left arm is now bent to some extent when dropping. Now you might be wondering how all of this translates to serving better and you can try this on the court yourself. If you're right-handed, toss the ball up and let your left arm drop flat before hitting the ball, or toss the ball and drop your left arm in a bent or angled position, like some of the best servers do, as you lean into the serve. You'll notice the shoulder rotation from the ladder gives you a much more fluid service motion. Watching matches from the bird's eye view with the cameras so high up doesn't always make you notice some of the subtle things about a player's game. And hopefully, we'll get some better viewing angles in the coming years. Anyways, back to Sabalenka, another thing she did to get rid of the double faults was develop her kick serve. Before, she was hitting hard slice serves a lot. Sabalenka still double faults occasionally, especially when she's going bigger on the second serves, but just take a look at how much she's cleaned up her serve in general. From a 10.4% double fault rate in 2022 to only 4.6% this year. Of course, players like Iga and Pagula are around the 2.5% mark and make far fewer double faults. They don't come close to Sabalenka in terms of dominating with their serve though, either. Sabalenka dominates you by winning way more free points on unreturned serves, like aces and service winners, and then if she just wins half of her remaining points, the job's done. 
By the way, don't forget that we're doing something new with our deep dives. As part of our deal with Sucker Punch, we've introduced the What's the Dill section, where we'll be answering your best questions that you ask in our communities. Shout out to Grippy the Cat and Daria for asking super pertinent questions about how Sabalenka fixed her serve. It was really all about biomechanics before the technique. But beyond that though, there's something that hasn't really been discussed as much. Sabalenka's tenacity and mentality. When you study top players, you'll notice they all have different traits. Some are more open to change than others and are willing to experiment through trial and error and adapt to new things while staying disciplined on the new change. We'll come back to this when we're talking about Sabalenka's ground strokes. But back to the serve. Sabalenka knew she had a problem, and she called for help and was willing to do anything to fix the yips. Here's what her biomechanics coach said about working with her. What I knew from the beginning from her was like, when, like I said, is that, hey, you've got somebody that's willing to fight. Throughout her struggles, Sabalenka had reached a breaking point, cried, and had tried everything with her coaches. She had clocked in countless hours with sports psychologists and practiced a lot, but nothing had worked. But Sabalenka was never one to back down from a challenge, and she was willing to completely rework her serve from the ground up. If you play tennis, you already know how hard muscle memory kicks in. Try taking someone who's played for seven years with a one-handed backhand and make them hit with a two-hander and let me know how it goes. The point being, it takes a champion's mentality to break down a stroke and relearn the fundamentals as a top player. And that's something that we have to give Sabalenka a ton of credit for. Here's what she said about the change. I'm super happy that this thing, this my serve happened to me before because before I wouldn't be really open for that. I would be like, you know what, my serve is fine, I don't want to change anything. But actually, even when my serve was working, it wasn't really right. When you see Sabalenka on the court, she only has one goal in mind, to dominate you on every front. She's the kind of player to take the racket out of your hands and to force you to dance to her tune. I mean, even her grunts leave a sort of footprint during the match. This brings us to a comment from Sebastian, one of our subscribers. Are there clues to the suspicion that Sabalenka uses her grunting tactically to distract opponents? Well, this conversation has come up a number of times. In the Australian Open semis, when Sabalenka beat Coco Gauff, a reporter asked Gauff after the match how the screaming and grunting affected her on court. I thought Gauff's response was pretty perfect. Can her grunt ever be distracting? Because sometimes it was still going on when you hit the ball. No. I feel like at least with her, it's consistent, uh, so it doesn't bother me. I mean, I've played a player in a, a, the past where the grunt wasn't consistent, where they would grunt longer on purpose on like 30 all or deuce points. So if it's consistent, like I can't really say anything about it. I don't think it's a tactic or anything. I think that's just how she plays tennis. Now there's no doubt that we've sometimes heard extended grunts, which means that the screams carry over to when her opponent hits the ball. But here's the thing about grunting. Many tennis coaches will tell you that grunting helps you because when you exhale forcefully and loudly, it not only helps your breathing, but also your core muscles. Your core tightens, and that allows for a more efficient energy transfer and increased stroke velocity, and some studies even argue in favor of grunting. But here's the ugly side. Grunting may sometimes influence an opponent's judgment on a ball's trajectory and pace, and may make you overestimate the shot coming. But just like Coco said, Sabalenka's grunting has been constant, and I don't see her deliberately trying to cheat, but I will say this. If a grunt carries over to when the opponent hits the ball, the rules should be enforced as expected. But unfortunately, I don't think there are any solutions when it comes to how loud grunting can be. Sometimes, really, it bothers the spectators more than the opponent. Sometimes. Still, I don't think we can enforce any sort of gruntometer to indicate when a player is screaming too loudly. If you're watching on TV, you might as well turn down the volume a bit, and if you bought a ticket, well, I guess you're out of luck. To be fair, it's not something you see on the WTA Tour alone. Many ATP players grunt all the time, and one of the goats who we all love even had a trademark grunt himself. Safe to say, grunting has become a part of the sport. Though when it's extended, it should be called out. Another thing that needs to be talked about is Sabalenka's forehand, which, in my opinion, is the best on tour. I'm sure we all saw the stats about how Sabalenka hits the fastest average forehand of anyone, man or woman. Her average forehand speed was 80 miles an hour, or 129 kilometers per hour, which I should mention is faster than both Sinner and Alcaraz. Of course, we know the men put a lot more spin and hit heavier, but bloody hell does Sabalenka hit hard. One thing with Sabalenka's ground strokes is that she has the natural ability to hit big into big targets in order to keep the points short. 
Back in 2022, when Sabalenka hit an all-time low, this was the problem especially on her plus ones. She was hitting wild and inexcusable shots even when staring at defeat, and as an opponent, you just needed to get a couple balls back in play and allow her to self-destruct on her unforced errors. But Sabalenka didn't throw in the towel and take a couple miles per hour off her forehand to play it safe. That would have literally been like cheating herself off of her biggest weapon. Instead, she worked on not increasing the margin for error by not hitting as flat as she used to, and more importantly, she worked on her timing. Sabalenka can rush you while playing within her means, which usually means fewer errors than before. Also, we now see a version of a player that's able to change direction a lot better than most players, especially in the neutral rallies. Plus, once she gets you on the run, you'll barely have time to recover. Take a look at what she did to Alexandrova on this point. Zeroing in on Sabalenka's movement, we see a player that moves really well for her height. She can still scramble when she needs to, she can track down balls, and has no problem compared to someone like Rybakina who's just an inch taller, but we've seen struggle with movement at times. Also, her positioning has been great too. And then there's her net game in volleys, which have also gotten a lot better. We sometimes forget that she's a former world number one in doubles, and truth be told, the balance between power and finesse is something that's always been tough to find. On the men's side, only Alcaraz comes to mind among the younger guys playing at the highest level there. I'm sure there are other guys though, but on the women's side, there aren't that many either. Sabalenka isn't quite there yet herself, but to me, it looks like she's getting better every day, isn't she? The drop shots are good. The volleys are beyond reach, even though they might not be the prettiest, but they get the job done. On top of all of these improvements, Sabalenka now has impeccable emotional control. Her body language remains positive even when things aren't going her way. So then how can someone get the better of her? To answer your question, Ethan, Sabalenka has struggled against top returners like Coco Gauff because they force Sabalenka to hit the extra ball or even go for the lines where she's prone to missing. The 2023 US Open final was a case in point of that. For the next question on top players that pose the biggest threat to Sabalenka, I'll take the Americans Pagula and Navarro because we saw what they could do against her at this year's US Open. As long as you get as many returns in as possible, there's always a chance. Both players have similar styles and are great returners, and if they add a little more offensive punch to their game, they could become real problem. Of course, Iga is always going to be a problem for Sabalenka on slower surfaces, and a healthy Rybakina too on hard courts. Ekaterina Alexandrova is another top 20, top 30 nightmare for Sabalenka, and one thing about Alexandrova is that she doesn't respect your serves. The only thing on her mind is how to punish you on those second serves, and sometimes even on your first serves. Alexandrova was the only one to take a set off Sabalenka at the US Open this year, and let's not forget about the time that she beat both Iga and Pagula in Miami earlier this year. So she's definitely a dangerous player when she's in the zone. What else am I missing? Be sure to let me know in the comments. That being said, I don't really see anybody dominating Sabalenka because of her style of play and just how clutch she is in the big moments. Sabalenka's clutch tendencies are also something that we need to point out because she now hits about as many unreturnable serves in pressure situations as she does at other times. And there's no guarantee that the player at the opposite side of the net will step up to the plate and even return better anyway. For Sabalenka, the confidence in her game is at an all-time high, and she trusts her game so much that she can blow away double break points and then stop the rot to go on to win the set without even altering her game too much, just because she knows the reward for her style of play. And the scary part is that she continues to get better. Her qualities are already scary good, but Sabalenka under pressure is a different beast entirely, and you can tell that no one wants to face her. If there's any part of Sabalenka's game that has a lot of room for improvement, it would be her ability to put returns in play off the serve. It's great, but currently not on par with the rest of her game. In fact, 13 players inside the top 50 have a higher percentage of return points in play. Of course, this is excluding aces and double faults. Sabalenka's power and positioning means that she sometimes tries to bite off a little too much on the return, and then she often ends up missing the target. Imagine if she feels just as comfortable on defense as she does on the offense. It's going to be game over for the rest of the tour. For those worrying about the unforced errors in some matches, they're just a byproduct of her game, and sometimes stats can really be deceptive because of how different the match dynamics can be. So I really wouldn't glean too much meaning from this. But Vec wants to know what makes Sabalenka's style so effective on hard courts. With a 27-1 record in hard court majors over the last two seasons, Sabalenka is no doubt the queen of hard courts at the moment. But why is she so good on the surface? 
Playing your best tennis on a particular surface all comes down to being able to maximize your strengths and minimize your weaknesses. In Sabalenka's case, she gets more dividends from her serve than she would on clay. And in addition to that, Sabalenka also gets the most out of her forehand because of the predictability of the bounce on hard courts, so she has no problems unleashing that stroke. Hard courts also bring a certain balance to her game, too. The medium or medium fast court speeds in particular allow you to dominate with your serve and forehand. In addition to that, hard court doesn't really test her footwork or movement like grass or clay. But these aren't exactly weaknesses for her either. The truth is that Sabalenka has developed a game that can thrive on any surface, and it's not surprising that she's reached the semis or better of every Grand Slam, and I have no doubt that she'll win a Wimbledon title. She's played the tournament only twice as a top player, and yet has reached the semis on both occasions. If her slice can get even better, it'll definitely be useful for her on the surface. Winning Roland Garros is always going to be the more difficult one because of Iga, but if there's anyone who can wrestle the title away from the pole, it's Sabalenka. And if the weather manages to heat up and the humidity is low, the balls travel faster and Arena will fancy her chances. Besides, she's won multiple WTA 1000s on clay and has given Iga a run for her money in some of those finals, being only one point away from the title in Rome as an example. Iga, on the other hand, hasn't reached the semis of any major outside the French Open since 2022, but I'm pretty sure that's going to change soon enough. But responding to Mitan Schmital, yes, Sabalenka can become an all-surface player. In fact, I'd even say that she already is. While her skill set isn't totally optimized for clay, you have to admit that she's a favorite for the title anytime she enters a tournament. Can she dethrone Iga from the top? Yes, she can. There are plenty of points up for grabs on the Asian hardcourt swing going on now, and less than 400 points separate both players for the year-end number one ranking. Oh, and by the way, Sabalenka totally has the momentum on her side. Apart from working out the kinks in her game, Sabalenka's consistency and trajectory is even more satisfying considering everything she's been through. From winning the WTA Newcomer of the Year award in 2018, to losing her dad to meningitis in 2019, to watching her game fall apart, dealing with a few nagging injuries, losing her ex-boyfriend earlier this year, it's been a lot of ups and downs. And it's even more interesting to know about the uniqueness of her team. Her coach Dubrov is a 29-year-old former player who was never ranked higher than world number 1900 or so. He was only 25 when he started working with Sabalenka, so he didn't really have the experience of some of the veteran coaches either. And then there's Stacy, who's essentially a martial arts specialist who found his way into tennis after being a trainer for combat fighters and the Seattle Sounders before they were an MLS team. The biomechanics expert Gavin McMillan was better known for training rugby, football, and baseball players than top players in tennis. But it worked, didn't it? According to Sabalenka's coaches, it's all about open, honest communication and being able to make work fun for both parties. I'm eager to see how the Sviantec sabalenka rivalry unfolds from here. But for now, Sabalenka has made a strong case for herself for WTA Player of the Year. Not to be blinded by recency bias, Sviantec has four WTA 1000 titles and a slam this year. Yeah, she won the titles in Doha, Indian Wells, Madrid, and Rome, and also defended her Roland Garros title, and not to mention she's been number one all year. Sabalenka, on the other hand, has two slams, one 1000 title, and has had a lot of deep runs. So yeah, it's not so straightforward to put one future Hall of Famer over the other, but Sabalenka obviously has the edge and can even make a stronger statement in the remaining tournaments of the year. At 26 years old, Sabalenka is in the midst of her prime, and we can only imagine what the finished product will look like. Over to you guys. What are your thoughts about Sabalenka's 2024 season, and what do you think about her chances of dethroning Iga from the top spot long term? If you like this video, be sure to smash that subscribe button, and if you missed out on the video that I did about the American men and their Grand Slam chances, I've got you covered right here.